Uh, there's a passage that I wanted to, to highlight. You said, my hilarious comedy of a marriage turned out to be the biggest joke of all. That night in the dark, God dragged me through the emptiest valley of the shadow of death, the lowest altitude of my life. I needed to pray, but how do you pray to a God who allowed this joke of a marriage? What do you even say? I crawled out of bed onto the floor. God, I said into the dark, help. Was God listening? Was he a fiction too? If, he, if God was just as unreal as my marriage, then what to make of virtues of love and justice and mercy, which emanated from the character and person of God according to the teach of, teachings of my religion? What did I believe precisely about God anyway? Whatever future lay ahead for my family, I knew would be ter- determined by my answer to that question. The way you talk about your marriage, your, your, the way you talk about God, the way you talk about faith in this book is very, uh, it's, it's very self-exposing. It's very vulnerable, um, including, as you said, you know, a moment ago or alluded to a moment ago, sort of your negative experiences inside you know, some church uh, communities as you were processing this. There's an obvious answer to this question. I'll ask it anyway, which is why religion? Like, why was religion the place that you went to? Why did, why was faith the place that you turned to when your marriage fell apart? Well, in a sense, um, it wasn't so much faith, but it was um, the need for ultimate answers. And so when, when you experience something like this, whether it's uh, the tragic loss of a child, um, addiction, abuse, anything that's like up there, you know, level 10 uh, tsunami in your life, and you really want to, to do what's right, you want to know what's happening and make the right moves. What do I do about our home? What do I do about our children? What, how do I treat my wife? Do I burn all of our clothes in the yard? Do I take a baseball <laughs> bat and go, you know, beat this guy up? Do I move out? Um, you know, do I go on a sex bender and start drinking and using? Like, I wanted to do all of those things because I didn't know what to do. It was so extreme. So I, what do you do? Well, you look for wisdom. And this is anybody, Christians, non-Christians, no matter what you are, if, you, if you're trying to find real answers, not short-term solutions, but real, if you're trying to divine real truth out of this situation and know what to do, you're going to look for ultimate answers and ultimate wisdom. And what that means is uh, ancient wisdom. Like, all right, the human race has been around for a while now, and um, these ancient books, the Bible, the Tao Te Ching, the... Um, uh, any, any, you know, uh, Aristotle's poetics, even like the, these old plays, old books, old novels, uh, books of religious wisdom provide answers that are, um, more durable and no matter what you believe. And so for me, uh, the first immediate answer was, okay, I'm a Christian. So that, it, which purports to provide answers and guidance in a moment like this. So what does that look like? I know what my instincts tell me. I know what the culture tells me to do. The culture said, hey, man, you're good, man. Just like let this let this girl go and go live your best life. Burn all her clothes in the yard. You'll be fine. You're going to go find a, a, a new beautiful you if you just like focus on you. Um, that's what the culture said. Uh, and even some of my Christian friends. Like, I was going to oh, say, like, bad. even a lot of your Christian friends. I mean, there. it seems like there were only uh, maybe a handful who who were really urging you, like, go fight for your marriage. Go fight for your, your wife. Yes. The, the bad advice I got was uh, focus on you now. This is all about you. So go live your best life. Or uh, you should hate this woman now and you should uh, hurt her in every way that you can. And mm-hmm. even Christians said that. Like, cut mm-hmm. her off financially. Uh, make her feel great shame for what she's doing. There were, those were the two sort of bad answers. And I'm like, I know there's more. There's so much mercy in the Bible. And so how do you, what does that look like? So from the, the, the metaphor I give is I was raised in the church. I've, I've never not gone. I mean, I've, yeah, I've definitely had periods where I wasn't in church. Um, but I was raised in the church and I've, I've been a believer my entire life. So, uh, and I've heard all of the cliches and the metaphors and I, I've read the theology. I was even in seminary for a week before I dropped out. Like I've done it all. I've (laughs) preached sermons. I've read more theology than your average person. I've always been, um, a Presbyterian or at least in my adult life. And so I had all this knowledge. Um, and I'm like, wait, I've never really had to use this wisdom ever because my life has been pretty okay. 
And so it was like going in, you know, sometimes when you buy an old house, there's like a shed in the backyard and the shed is full of really old rusty tools. Mm -hmm. My grandfather's barn had these old rusty tools that you never knew what they were for. You could tell they used to be really important, but they hadn't been used in many years, you know, cobwebs and rust and all that. And for me, faith was like that. It was like wandering into this barn and going, okay, what does this stuff do? How do I use this stuff to actually not die? I mean, I was on the verge of death spiritually, morally, physically. I feel like, I mean, when you, when you have a, an affair, when there's a betrayal, you really open up the pit of hell. Like you invite the devil to the party. You invite the worst kind of evil. And that's why there are so many, you know, revenge killings when there are, you know, you have affairs like this is real. You are playing with darkness. And so going into this shed in my backyard or, you know, to, to be literal about it, opening the King James, I wanted, I wanted the old stuff. I wanted the good mm -hmm. old stuff. Like, what does this say? And so for me, I was like, okay, what does mercy look like? So I like the first thing I noticed as I was reading, there's a whole chapter in the book about reading the Bible. The first thing I, I noticed, and this was, again, these are stories that I'd heard in Sunday school and Bible bowl, Bible drill, sword drill. I did it all, Bible man. Bowl. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, I got my Bible bowl trophy still in my office. Um, but I was like, I was like, oh, wait. All of the heroes of the Bible are really despicable people. Like right. they're terrible people. And nobody would nobody talks about that. Or maybe if they did, I, I didn't notice it. And I'm like, all right, this makes me feel better because I'm feeling pretty despicable. Like I have ruined my marriage. And, I, and I'm sure my wife is feeling pretty despicable at what she's done. She was raised in the church too. And so that was a real comfort. Like, oh wow. So God loves like really terrible people. Like I knew that as a good Calvinist, of course I knew that, right. but like, Oh, I, I now realize that my wife and I are terrible people and we have, we are hurting our children right now with our decisions that we have made. And so that gave me a great comfort to that. These people could be loved by God and to see how they would, how they triumphed and how God pulled them through things. Um, so that's a, a long winded answer to, to a question of, of, um, me wrestling with what do I really believe about what is like, what is, you know, do justice, love mercy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, justice is not merciful. They're the opposite. That's a paradox. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with that? We read that and we're like, oh yeah. Or you, you go to a, a wedding and you hear, you know, um, love keeps no record of wrongs. Um, that's, that's like impossible. Right. Like, how do you do that? Right. How do you keep no record of wrongs? You know, I, I say that I, I think Jesus is probably the great, first great comedian in world history because so much of what he says is a joke. We don't read it as a joke because we right. read it in church where nobody really laughs. But he says, you know, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times. He goes, ha, ha, ha. No, no, no. Seventy times, seven times. Right. Seventy times, seventy times, seven times. And bec because he's acknowledging the ridiculousness of how many times you will have to forgive people you love. And so seeing that comedy in the Bible, I was like, wait, it is hard. Right. Uh, so what does it mean? Do justice and love mercy. Um, to, to be just would be to, in a sense, punish my wife for the wrong things she had done, but it would also mean to that I should be punished for all the wrong things I've done. Mm. Um, love mercy. Okay, so maybe doing justice means understanding right and wrong, understanding what, what those things are, uh, what is right, what is wrong. But loving mercy, uh, forgiving when people can't meet that impossible standard, yeah. keeping those two things in the mind at yeah. once. That idea, uh, I think, kept me alive throughout yeah. all this.